Thank you, Thomases, for the beautiful music this evening. And thank you for the testimonies. I've enjoyed every one of them. I feel like I've been to church already. I love to hear the accounts of people who got victory over sin and over the carnal heart. Sister, I really enjoyed your testimony. Can I use that in a sermon sometime for an illustration? If you have your Bibles open with me this evening to Romans chapter 3, and uh, what I'm going to talk about this evening is going to lay the foundation for our next three nights of preaching. I have taught Theology of Holiness for many years. I'm teaching it next semester, just going over my syllabus today for it. I make a lot of observations in that class, and uh, what I find shows me that there's a lot of confusion on the part of our young people. I get to pray with a lot of people at the altar in revivals and camp meetings, and I'm, I'm troubled by Sometimes how people seem to misunderstand really the, the basics. This evening I just want to talk to you about the basics. I, for example, will tell, tell the students on the first day of class, take out a half sheet of paper and jot down for me five sins that a person might commit or has committed in their lifetime, you yourself or someone else. Then I said, jot down five temptations that you might go through. And then I said, jot five... Uh, attributes of the carnal heart. And then I'll collect those and take them to my office later and sit there and worry and pine over what I'm reading. Because most of these young people have come out of Christian day schools. Many of them have grown up in church parsonages and attended holiness churches. And I'm wondering if their bright, young, fertile minds haven't got things sorted out any better than that, how in the world do they encounter the devil and temptations. How do you know if you're living above sin, if you don't know what sin is? How do you know what carnality is, what it isn't? I wrote, a, wrote an outline for uh, misconceptions about holiness. Left it on my computer at home, and I about half tempted to have my wife send me that document, and I'll print it off or write it off and might preach it out here. I don't know. I know what the Lord wants me to preach this evening, though, because uh, I wrestled with it all last night. Oh, I said some of those people have been in camp meetings where I've preached this. They, some of them will recognize it. Oh, maybe I'll change a few illustrations. Maybe they won't recognize it. And I got up this morning, turned on, turned on the computer, and opened my uh, email account, and I, I subscribed to uh, a couple of uh, devotionals. And the first thing my eyes fell on was the title of the sermon I was thinking about preaching for tonight. So I said, well, maybe, the, maybe I'm a little slow. Of course, last night was a little challenging. I had a drunk in the room next door that kept me up till about midnight last night, and 4 o'clock this morning we tried to wake him up and get him to turn his television off, and ended up moving me to another room. Three other people were complaining. We had a lot of excitement over at our place last night. So I got about five hours of sleep. But never fear, Sister Forsey gave me some sleepy time tea tonight for uh, the evening meal, so I'm, I'm good to go. Well, the question is, is it instantaneous or gradual, this business of entire sanctification? I remember, well, it was a Midwest Pilgrim uh, camp meeting at Frankfurt. I remember John Parker came on the campground. He walked up to me as I was unloading. Doc, he said, are you, uh, are you process or are you, uh, let's see, how did he say it? Are you, are you crisis or are you process? Are you instantaneous or gradual? I said, I'm both. Is it instantaneous? Is it gradual? What is the difference between a temptation and a sin? You know, if you come to the altar and you want to get delivered from sin and you get up and you testify you are, what have you been delivered from? What have you not been delivered from? What's the difference between a sin and a mistake? And the problem is we listen to so much Calvinistic preaching, and many times we don't really know they're Calvinistic unless we sit and parse what they're saying, and we read their literature, and, uh, and so it goes. And on top of that, it's kind of a shifting, moving target anyhow. Do you know this evening, according to a late survey done, I read in Christianity Today, that 
Of the Southern Baptists, only 15% of them are five-point Calvinists. Now, that's what I read in Christianity Today by somebody who knows how to take surveys. Did you hear about the preacher in the big Baptist church in Tulsa, Oklahoma? On Monday morning, called in his youth pastor into his office. The senior pastor looks at him. He said, son, he said, I heard you're preaching Calvinism over there, teaching Calvinism in your, in your youth group. And the young youth minister said, well, well, yes, isn't that what we are? And the pastor said, well, we've, we settled that problem years ago. So he said, son, I don't know how we're going to get along without you, but he said, starting right now, we're going to try. You're fired. And fired him as youth pastor for teaching Calvinism in a Baptist church. I read that in Christianity Today. I guess it's true. And then there are people like uh, Dale Moody, who taught uh, systematic theology at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary for 37 years. I have his book with me this evening. Dale Moody taught for 37 years at Southern Baptist. I guess he'd know a little bit about theology, wouldn't you think? 37 years in a seminary. And, uh, and he wrote a book, and then he wrote a uh, commentary, a little, a little book. It's a study in the epistle of the Hebrews and the Baptist history. And his book is called Apostasy. I just sent and bought it just so I could show it to you tonight. And uh, this book actually teaches of the warning passages in the book of Hebrews, Moody says you can actually backslide and lose your salvation. Really? And you know the president of Southern Baptist Theological Seminary called him in. It was in 1983. Dr. Roy Honeycutt was the president then at Southern Baptist down in Louisville. And he said, Dr. Moody said, uh, you wrote that book? Yes, sir. He says, you believe you can lose your salvation? Well, I said, I don't know how you can read the book of Hebrews and be intellectually honest and come to any other conclusion. Well, he said, Dr. Moody, he said, it's been nice having you on the staff for 37 years, but he said, this will be your last year here and forced him into retirement. So 15% uh, of Southern Baptists still hold to five-point Calvinism. So it's kind of a shifting target. No wonder people are in confusion as what's going on. So as I tell my students, Rather tongue-in-cheek, I'm from the IRS and I'm here to help you. I want to help you this evening. Now, I see it's already five minutes of eight, and I've really enjoyed the service thus far. But, you know, I've really enjoyed reading these uh, on the Facebook. There are just dozens of tributes to uh, uh, Brother French, Bob French. Some of you have been reading and some of you have been making comments. I've read your comments. And again and again, I see him talking about his hour and 15 minute and hour and a half sermons, and that gave me courage. <laughs> Brother French can preach for an hour and a half, uh, my. And my problem is I spent most of my life, more of my time behind a lectern than I have behind a pulpit. And you sort of get into a routine, you know, in your mind, you sort of program yourself. Monday, Wednesday, Friday classes are 50 minutes long. Tuesday, Thursday classes, hour and 15 minutes long. The seminary uh, night classes are three hours long. And Saturdays are eight hours long. And I sort of get into a certain cadence, you know, sort of a routine. So I've told people, you want to pray that I'm on my Monday, Wednesday, Friday schedule tonight. That's what you need to do. All right. <clears throat> All right. Let me, let me give you a quote from Dr. S.I. Emery. You wouldn't believe it if I said it to you, but maybe you would if Dr. Emery said it. Listen to what he said now. This is the attention getter for the evening. I'm not going to heaven because I've been entirely sanctified. I'm going to heaven because I've been justified and I've walked in all the light ever since. As Brother Atwell said, that might be over some of your heads, but not, ever, not all of your heads. Some of you will figure out what he's saying. In other words, once your record is wiped clean in heaven in justification, you keep walking in the light. Of course, you'll walk right on into holiness, just like the children of Israel should have marched right on into Canaan, but they didn't. So let's start with the basics this evening. You listen fast, and I'll try to move along here. Let's go to Romans chapter 3. We're just going to talk about some basics that we can agree on. And uh, it's in Romans 3.23. It's going to sound like the Roman road for some of you. Romans 3.23. We all agree on this statement. Paul said, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So nobody can stand up and testify and say, Well, thank God I've never sinned. 
You can't say that, friend. All have sinned. Won't waste any more time discussing that. We all are fallen children of Adam and Eve when we come into this world. Let's look at uh, Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Verse 12, chapter 5 said, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Now Paul says, Because all have sinned, all must die. Tonight I'm standing in front of a dying congregation. I don't mean to deflate you in any way, but the fact of the matter is you're dying tonight and you're looking at a dying preacher up here. We're all going down that way because we've been born into a family that's contaminated by sins. One fellow said statistics are very impressive. He said one out of every person dies. <laughs> well, really, that's, that's a pretty good statistic. It's hard to misunderstand that one. Somebody asked a little boy, I said, what do you want to be in 25 years? He said, alive. Wow, you can see where his focus in life was. He wasn't thinking occupation, he just wanted to be alive. Well, the interesting thing is, you know, when Eve partook of the forbidden fruit in the, uh, in the garden, we talk about it being an apple, we don't know what it was, but whatever it was, you know, when she did eat it, she didn't topple over dead. She went on living, talking, and so forth. The Satan said, you shall not truly die. And she didn't, at least at that moment. But you know, really, she died three ways. When Eve and Adam partook of the fruit, the physical death process began. That was as good as it was going to get for them. It was downhill from there physically. Spiritually, they both died. Paul says in Ephesians 2.1, Ye hath he quickened, that is, that he gave life to those who were dead in trespasses and sins. Do you know that unsaved world you see out there every day is dead? Don't be too hard on them, friend. They're dead. They have no spiritual life in them. And, of course, they both died eternally. Ezekiel says it, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Let's go to Romans chapter 6. I'm trying to... Move along here this evening. Romans chapter 6, verse 16 is a favorite verse of mine. Actually, there are two basic truths in there. I'll look at the first part of the verse. Paul says, by way of a question, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves, servants to obey, his servant ye are, to whom you obey? Do you know what Paul is saying here? He's saying that you and I, Everyone under the, under the sound of my voice this evening, you're under the control of one of two masters. You're a servant to either Satan tonight or you're a servant of Jesus Christ, of the Holy Spirit. And friend, I've spent a lifetime of ministry trying to show people there's no middle ground in between this thing. There's no murky gray area out there where you're not real bad and not real good. Jesus said, you're either for me or you're against me. You're either gathering, or you're scattering. But he said, to whom you yield yourselves as servants to obey, the nice thing is, the good news I want to tell you tonight is you get to choose your master. And you've chosen the one you're serving tonight. If you're sitting here out of victory tonight, that's your choice to be that way. I'm here to tell you that Jesus wants to deliver you. Do you remember that fellow, Timothy McVeigh, the fellow who blew up that Murrah building out in Oklahoma City? I was out there with a, uh, at a uh, revival a year or so ago and in a camp meeting last summer and I had them take me by the, the memorial there. They've really done a job. The architect has really designed a memorial of what that awful event was that day. Well, that Timothy McVeigh, he was making, spouting a lot of big statements from death row and a lot of it was just hot air, but he did say a couple of statements that were true. He said, I'm the captain of my soul. He said, I'm the master of my destiny. And I said, well, you know, you got that one right, Timothy McVeigh. That's true. You're the master of your destiny tonight. Where you spend eternity is entirely up to you, friend. Nobody else has anything to do with that. So you get to choose your master. And you will choose your master on how you make choices throughout the day. Have you thought of how many choices you've made 
today. Now this day is winding up. We're getting down a little after eight o'clock already. You know, if I'd stop you at the door back here with a legal pad and we'd start down over a list of the decisions you've made today, we'd be here all night while I try to write them down. You've made thousands of decisions. Many of you almost made them involuntarily. You made them almost without thinking about them. I often tell my students, the first decision you make in the morning is when you hear that alarm clock go off. <laughs> really, do you know anything more beautiful than a lovely alarm clock? There's just something sweet and melodious about it, isn't there? Wow, that's just so refreshing in the morning. Oh, I hate that thing, and so do you. And then when it goes off, you have to make a choice. What are you going to do about it? There it is, beeping or clanging or something. And maybe you decide, well, I'm going to shut this thing off. So you reach out, maybe it's still dark, and you feel around, and you hit a snooze button or something, and you get it quiet. Now you've got that thing quiet, immediately you've got to make another choice. Now what do you do? You can lay there and catch a few winks, or you can get up. Have you ever tried the first one, option? How does that work for you? Any better than it does for me? <laughs> okay, so you say, I'm going to get up. So you throw your feet over the side of the bed, and you stretch, and you yawn, and you head for the bathroom. Before long, you're standing in there in front of the faucet. The blue says cold. The red says hot. You've got choices to make. Will it be this morning, hot or cold? Maybe a mixture of the two, whatever. Now you're in the closet looking for clothes. What'll I wear? You gotta decide on something. Now you're down in the kitchen looking through the cupboard. What'll I eat this morning? Making choices. And it's time to go to work. You make a choice. You decide to drive to work. Since it's 20 miles, rather than a walk, you're gonna drive. You make that choice. <laughs> now you're out in the garage and you get in the car and you decide to use a key to start the thing. It's always easier than trying to hotwire it. So you put the key in it, you decide to turn the thing. I mean, you see what I'm saying? It just, and then it's, now you got the thing running, now it's time to back, oh, you better open the garage door. You better make that choice. I tried it one time with the garage door half open. By the glick, it doesn't work very well. That'll get me down to my auto repair shop. Uh, I used to pastor him. I always said, I love you. He said, you bring me more business. <laughs> so you decide to use reverse. That's always best to get it out of the garage. Now you're out in the street and you choose drive and now you're going down. You know, you have been ma you've made hundreds of decisions already and probably not one of those choices has any moral value attached to it. Doesn't mean a thing about your walk with God or how you're getting along. These are just necessary choices. But now as you're cruising down to the local intersection, you see that red sign. It says S-T-O-P. Now you've got another choice to make. How did Brother Egan say it? I told you with somebody, I told you about it at the supper table tonight. Stopped late one night down in Alabama somewhere. Trooper pulled him over. The fellow said, didn't you see that stop sign? Yes, Brother Egan said, but I didn't see you. <laughs> I have students who talk about doing a rolling stop. Now that's a good one for you, isn't it? A rolling stop. Do you know what an oxymoron is? That's a self-contradictory expression. You can't have it both ways. You either stop or you keep rolling. We have a four-way stop about a mile and a half from our house. A little crossroad there, that's the town of New Garden. All it is is a four-way stop. And there's an Ohio State patrolman who likes to park back in that abandoned gas station back in there and keeps an eye on things. One morning I decided to go over and greet him, so I drove over alongside the state police car, rolled my window down. Here was a woman. I was a woman trooper. And uh, she greeted me, and I said, uh, how you doing? Fine. I said, is this a good place for you to park? Oh, she said, I do good business here. Yeah, it's a good place, sure enough. You see, when you saw that stop sign, now you're going to make a choice that has some moral value attached to it. God's word says some things about being in subjection to the authorities and the rulers and so forth. If you can learn to make your choices right, the moral choices, you can live above sin, friend. You get to choose. You get to choose if you're going to obey the rules at school. You get to choose if you're going to obey the rules at home. Mom and dad have rules. Teachers have rules. Churches have rules, 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 rules. Everywhere you go is rules. You get to choose what you say. Did you know that? 
Oh, I've pastored people that say, oh, I just, I just blurted out, you know, without, no, 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 no. You get to choose your words. And you'll answer for your words according to what Jesus said. If you didn't get to choose them, I doubt if he'd have you answering for them. But he says every idle word, every word you say, you'll answer for it. You get to choose what you look at. It always gets real quiet when I mention that. You get to choose what you look at. <clears throat> now, you can't help what you see, but you choose what you look at. Can you sort that out, what I just said? You can't help what you see. God gave you a beautiful pair of lenses. It's like a camera up there. It'll just scan the horizon. It'll take in things. Your peripheral vision will pick up things on the side. That camera's just working like it's supposed to. You can't help what it brings in. But once it brings in something and you process that signal, you get to choose now what you're going to look at. You get to choose if you take a second look or not. Do you know there was a church father, actually he was an Eastern Orthodox, John of Damascus. The Eastern Church calls him St. John of Damascus. Do you know around the year A.D. 600, he wrote this in one of his books. He said, I fast with my eyes. How about that? I fast with my eyes. John of Damascus said, there are just some things I won't look at. Wow, if he said that in A.D. 600, what he would say in A.D. 2014 on a hot summer day down at Walmart? Whew. Talk about fasting with your eyes. About need blinkers, blinders or something. I fast with my eyes. Now, how you make these choices, the ones that have moral, moral value attached to them, determines your relationship with God. He holds you responsible for the choices you make. In fact, as you make the right choice, we like to say, along with John and his epistle, that uh, if we walk in the light as he's in the light, the blood cleanses us and we have fellowship. Do you know all you can do is walk in your light? You can't do anything more than that, and you better not do anything less than that. You can't walk in light you haven't had, but you must walk in the light you do have by making the right choices. So that leads me to my little definition of what light is. I've shared this several places and go home, turn on my computer, and somebody's already got it on Facebook, quoting me. Here's my definition. Light is God's opinion on any matter. Could I repeat that for you? Light is God's opinion on any matter. And I found this, that if you take time and ask God what his opinion is, he'll let you know. Some people don't want to know. The new converts generally do. It's amazing. I've pastored some new converts, and they'll move from the back row to the front row after they get saved. And they'll tell me in the vestibule, they'll say, just hit me, preacher. Go ahead and hit me. Just shoot at me. They want to know the worst of their case, and they want to line up. But boy, there's those ones that used to be up front, and they start drifting farther and farther back, you know, and they get kind of quiet on you. It's, you, know, you wonder if they still want to know. I heard about a fellow who uh, took a three-by-five index card and taped it over his speedometer. He didn't want to know. <laughs> That's real bright, isn't it? Can you believe that? It actually happened. Light is God's opinion on any matter. God has opinion. I said, I said most of those early morning decisions don't have any moral value attached, probably. Maybe when you stopped by the closet and picked what you was going to wear for the day, maybe that did have some moral value attached to it. You might walk by the mirror and say, Lord, how does this look today? Are you okay with this, God? Now, don't ask him if you don't want to know, but I've had ladies tell me God will tell them about that. And guys, too. God has an opinion on your music. Do you know I prayed with people at the altar? And, I, and like, by the way, what I'm mentioning right now, these are not off the top of my head. These come from life's experience. I'll just tell you what I heard at the altar. How's that? I won't tell you what I think. I'll just, tell you, I'll just give you some feedback tonight. My nephew is bawling and squalling down at the Stoneboro. Some of you have been to Stoneboro. I, I don't know how many feet of altar space there is. Hundreds of people there. He's over here crying, late teenage boy. Finally, he dried up a little bit. I said, John, I said, do you know what your problem is? Oh, Uncle Paul, he said, I know what my problem is. That's my music. 
Now, apparently for a young teenager to go to the altar and cry about it, apparently music might be a negative factor in your life. Maybe some music's not good for you. Young people go to the altar and pray about it. I don't know. I'm just telling you what they said. God has an opinion on what you do in your downtime, <clears throat> what you do for recreation. Do you know I've pastored people who just seem to get along, they just thrive about 50 weeks out of the year. And then vacation time comes and they pack up and head out and they're gone for two weeks. And when they come back, Brother Thomas, there's something different about them. And I've often wondered what they did during those two weeks where they come home so dry. Do you suppose maybe they compromised a little bit, thought they were far enough away they'd get away with it or something, did something they shouldn't have? I don't know. I think God has an opinion on what you do for recreation and vacation. He has an opinion, of course, on life's companion, probably one of the most important decisions you'll ever make. A wife or a husband will make or break you. How many young men used to come by my office and ask me what I thought about the girl they were going to date? What do they, th they said, what do you think? Can you see her in the park? What do you think? Is she potential for parson? And I used to be dumb enough to tell them what I thought. <laughs> Boy, I'm a slow learner. They'd go right out and tell the girl everything I said, you know. I thought I, was, <laughs> thought I was giving counsel in my office, you know. Instead, I'm in the process of losing a friend. Our old pastor, when I was a young man in Bible school, you'd have to know him, dear Brother McPherson. Some of you know him. Brother McPherson was all burdened down about some of the matches he saw shaping up from among the Bible college boys. One morning, as only he could say it, right in the middle of a worship service, men, he said, some of you could have reached out in the dark and done better than that. <laughs> he was all concerned. They were matching up the wrong way. God has an opinion. If you'll take time to ask him, he'll give you his opinion. Certainly, God has an opinion about life's work. Do you know what I've stopped doing? I've stopped asking young people what they want to be when they grow up. You know what I like to do? I like to ask, what's God want you to do when you grow up? I'd like to inculcate that idea. God's already got a plan for you. Forget your plan. Find what's the plan God has for you. And God will give you his opinion, and you'll be happy if you'll follow his opinion. So you'll walk in the light. And as I said, that's all you can do. And by the way, Take it easy on the other fellow who doesn't have as much light as you do. Don't try to help the Lord out by giving people light. There are three ways you get light, perhaps more. I'm just going to mention three for the sake of uh, brevity here. You get your light, first of all, from the Bible. The psalmist says, the entrance of thy word giveth light. I don't know how to quantify it, but I would suspect you're probably getting 90%, 95% of your light right out of the Bible. And by the way, God will never let you do something and tell you something that contradicts his word. Stick with the word and you'll be all right, friend. You'll get most of your light there. You'll get your light from your conscience. John says in his gospel, he's the light which lighteth every man coming into the world. God builds a little built-in moral indicator in your heart. We call it the conscience. We sing that song, quick as the apple of thine eye, O God, my conscience make. I want to have a tender conscience, friend. I've pastored people. I've got some friends and relatives that have messed around with their conscience till it's totally unreliable. They've educated their conscience or they've seared it. It's not reliable at all. If you keep a tender conscience and you walk in the light, God will Speak so you can hear him. If you want to hear his voice, he wants to be manifest to you. And then there are personal convictions. Sometimes God will just speak to you about a matter. He says, son, I know everybody else is doing it, but for you, I really don't want you to do that, son. That's just unique for you. You don't have to testify about it unless you, unless you think I want you to. That's just between you and me. And I could give you some examples. Sometimes I take time right here, but this evening's a little late. I'm not going to take time, but I give you some examples where God gives an individual conviction where they should go, not go, maybe something about clothing or whatever, and God will speak specifically to you. Probably not as a new convert, but as you move along with the Lord, since he knows you, he knows how you're put together, he knows what uh, moves you, what stirs you, what 
you respond to, God may give you some things that's just unique to you because he trusts you. Now, you can live above sin if you'll walk in the light, if you'll make the right choices. It always takes two ingredients to commit a sin, and I want to focus on this this evening. I want to bear down a little bit here. Two ingredients must be present or you haven't sinned. You must know something is wrong or right, and then you must choose to do it. You gotta know, you gotta have light on it. And then just having light, now you have to have the chance to make the decision. And uh, if you don't have the light on it and you made a choice, then it wasn't a sin because you didn't know it was wrong. If you knew something was wrong, but you chose not to do it, you didn't choose to do it, you're still in the clear. You have to do both things to commit a sin, and that's just good basic Methodist theology. You must know and you must choose. And when Satan tries to haunt you later and say, ah, you sinned, you can just look back and say, now, wait a minute, did I know it was wrong? Did I choose to do it? And you can find out where you're at at any moment of the day. Because I prayed with people at the altar. I say, well, why are you here, friend? They'll pray for a while and we'll talk a little bit. So, well, I don't know. I just felt like I should come tonight. Well, I might get around and ask him, well, have you ever been saved? Well, yes. I mean, you really confessed your sins and you repented. You told God you were going to change, and you believed him, and God saved you. Yes. I said, now, have you sinned since then? And their eyes will kind of glaze over, and they'll kind of get a foggy look to them, and they're not sure if they have or not because they don't know what sin is. Just to have some negative feelings about something doesn't mean you sin. Just to be tempted doesn't mean... You may go through a tremendous temptation, and it was so troubling to you. You may have thought afterwards, I must have sinned. Boy, I just really felt like I was terribly under a cloud. No. Did you choose? And until you make the choice, you didn't sin. Temptation is common to all of us. I get tempted every day, and so do you. A little boy went into the grocery store one hot summer morning. He was hungry, and he was broke. Now, grocery stores are no place for hungry, broke boys. And he wanders up and down the aisles looking at the food, ends up back in the produce section, and he's standing there looking at that mound of apples. They've got all polished up, kind of pyramid shape. And the double doors swing open, and out comes the produce manager and catches this boy standing there staring at that pile of apples. Hey, boy, I said, what are you trying to do, steal one of my apples? And the boy looked up at him, and he said, no, he said, I'm trying not to. Well, son, why don't you just get out of there? <laughs> you know, we make our own problems. I prayed with the young people at the altar, and they tell me I'm, I've got to change com friends. My companions are no good for me. They know that. They know where their area of weakness is. Maybe you need to change some companions. Probably if you're really on fire for the Lord, most of those bad companions are going to kind of steer away from you anyhow because they're going to be uncomfortable around you. If you're living so close to them that they're comfortable around you, maybe you uh, need to get a little closer to the Lord. Yes. It's really not a big problem if you really walk in the light because they'll just sort of peel off and go their own way. They'll get tired of you raining on their party. But then old habits die hard. I heard about the lady who wanted to lose weight, Christian lady, relatively new convert, and she prayed about it. Half the holiness people I know want to lose weight. Men and women both. This seems to be a chronic issue. And uh, so this lady, she figured out what her problem was. When she drove to work in the morning, she'd go down to that intersection on Main Street and take a right and go up there, and there was the pastry shop up there. That was her besetting sin. So she said, I'm going to outsmart this thing. She decided to go a different way. So instead of turning there, she would go a block beyond, go the long way around, and on out to her place of work. And it worked well for quite a while, but as I just said, Old habits die hard. Sure enough, sort of half absent minded, one, one morning she got down to that intersection, turned right, started down Main Street, and looked up and saw that pastry shop sign, and oh no. And then she had this brilliant idea. She prayed. She said, Lord, she said, if you want me to have any of those pastries this morning, she said, you'll have to have me a parking spot right in front of the main entrance, and then I'll know it's okay. That's how she prayed. Later, she told her friends how it worked. She said, sure enough, she said, on the eighth trip around the block, 
There was a parking spot right in front of the pastry. She said, I went and got my cream sticks and came out, and she said, as I drove away, I said, oh, isn't God good? <laughs> That's what we do. And then we look in the mirror and say, what went wrong? Just being tempted is not the same as sinning. We're all going to be tempted. Don't let Satan trick you up, friend. God can help you in the place of temptation. I like to ask my Pentateuch students, at what point in the temptation did Eve really cross the line and commit the sin? Now here she is, there's this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, have no idea what it was all about. Theologians think they have generally an idea why God must have put that there as a time of probation. And Eve, very foolishly, like the pastry lady, is hanging around this tree, and here comes Satan. Yea, hath God said, he starts off asking questions, and finally, she starts down the wrong road. Now I ask my students the question, at what point did she really incur guilt? When does she sin? Now, arms don't move without some impulses from the brain. Is it when that arm first starts moving out toward the forbidden fruit, going toward the fruit, is that when she sinned? Or maybe she doesn't, maybe she's in the clear until she actually touches the fruit. Maybe contact with the fruit does it. Maybe that's her sin. Maybe it's okay until she actually breaks it loose at the stem. Maybe that's it. Or maybe it's not until she starts back toward her mouth with the fruit. Maybe she's still okay until she actually touches the skin to her teeth and bites through it. Maybe it's not until she swallows it, sends it across her palate and down the esophagus. At what point, class, did she actually sin? And I always get a bunch of volunteers and a half a dozen guesses. And finally, some Sharpie who's heard me somewhere else gives me the right answer. Do you know what the answer is? She sinned when she gave the consent of her will to do it. Before she moved a muscle, the recording angel in heaven's already got her guilty of sin. Why you say, how could that be? She didn't even reach, she didn't move. She never touched it, she didn't eat it. How could she have sinned? She gave the consent of her will. She knew it was wrong and she made the choice. And the minute she makes the choice, she crosses the deadline. Let me illustrate it another way for you. Well, I'll back up and say this. You might say, well, that's a little theoretical. Do you got any proof for that? Well, I think I do. We go to the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus is talking to them, and he says, you have heard that it hath been said, thou shalt not commit adultery. But he said, I say unto you, you know where I'm going, whoso looketh upon a woman to lust after her, is guilty of the sin of adultery. Jesus said that. I'm going to go with Jesus on this one. All right? You say he never touched her. He never suggested a thing to her. He never spoke a word. He never made a move. But in his mind, he said, I would if I could. If my wife wouldn't catch me or my husband, if my church wouldn't find out about it, if this wouldn't cost me my job, my career, and in your mind, you said, I would if I could, God said, you've crossed the line. Once you made the choice, friend, you bought the farm. Jesus said so. Now, I sort of jokingly say, let me illustrate it this way. Let's suppose Pastor Forsey and I decide we're running a little lean on cash. You remember when Peter and John went up to the temple to pray? Like typical holiness preachers, they told the, the beggar, they said, silver and gold, have I none? Typical holiness preacher, broke. So I say, well, Brother Forsey, I, I see a Huntington bank up here on Main Street. Before I head out of town on Monday, let's, uh, let's go up there and do a bank job. Saturday, we'll go down and case the joint. We'll look it over. We'll go in, check out the teller's cages, and we'll get the lay of the land. We'll decide who's going to do the talking. We'll decide who's going to drive the getaway car. We'll even discuss how we're going to split the proceeds. Since this is my idea, I probably ought to get a larger cut than you, but <laughs> maybe 50-50. Okay, I'll be magnanimous. And we get this deal all ready to go for 10 o'clock Monday morning before I go back to Ohio. So I pick him up at 9.30 and pull out on the suicide alley out front here and a Mack truck runs over us and flattens us. 
We're two grease spots on Route 32, is it? Do you know on the books of heaven we'll have to answer for a bank robbery? You say, well, you never got near the place. You didn't get in the parking lot. You didn't go in the lobby. You never said a word. You never saw a dollar. No, but we gave the consent of our will. And that's when you cross the line. And that's good Methodist theology. <clears throat> our Sunday school teacher at Hope Sound is a dear man, Brother Finney. Everybody loves Brother Bruce Finney. He was telling last spring about going to Cracker Barrel with a group of people to eat one night. I think they're down in West Palm Beach. Saturday night, half a dozen of the old timers are down there eating in Cracker Barrel. So they finished their meal, went out into the, uh, the gift area, and there are a lot of people waiting at the cash register. So he, he decides to look around for gifts a little bit. And finally, he walked out and got in his car, went back to Hope Sound, forgot to pay his bill. Got home, reached in his pants pocket, and there was his bill. Not only stiffed the waitress, didn't leave a tip, he didn't pay for his meal, he won. Man, a life, he said, what am I going to do? Now, my question is, did he sin? Now, he really could get locked up for that. I mean, that's a crime. You just don't go into Cracker Barrels and eat and walk out without paying for it. Do you know, now listen closely, some of you won't like this, but you know what? You can be guilty of a crime without being guilty of a sin. You work on that. You'll get through it later on. He didn't, he didn't choose not to pay that bill. He simply forgot it. One of my trips to Israel, I had a slew of people from Ashland Theological Seminary with me and some people from Hobe Sound. March the 9th, snow blizzard up in northeastern Ohio. My daughter and son-in-law drove me to the airport, my wife. I mean, it was blinding. What should have been a half-hour drive was an hour and a half to get there, but you never know. A plane might get off the ground. You can't just... After all, this thing had been planned for nine months. We ended up missing our flight. Next morning, we did catch a flight. Now it's Sunday morning. I'm walking around JFK trying to find passage to Israel. The next four flights are oversold, and about 15 of us have missed our flights because of the weather. So we talked to El All on the phone, and they said, well, you've got to wait for about 11 o'clock, and the ticket agents will be down there. We'll see what we can do for you. So we're milling around on Sunday morning when I'm used to being in Sunday school and church. Here I am, through no fault of my own, and some of my group decides to head down to McDonald's. So just to keep the group together, I went down. And I'm sitting there at McDonald's, and they're eating their breakfast. They don't have a problem with buying on the Lord's Day. So I just looked at my wife and said, Honey, why don't you get us a couple of senior decafs, and we'll sit here and drink some coffee. She had packed a little lunch for us because we don't buy on the Lord's Day. She gave me kind of a funny look. I said, well, okay, if you don't want to, I will. She said, well, don't get me any. I don't want any. And I sauntered up to the cashier and ordered myself a decaf coffee, 9 o'clock Sunday morning in JFK Airport. I went back and sat down across from her and started to drink this, and my wife said, honey, do you know what day it is? And I but threw the coffee on my lap. I said, oh, what in the world have I done? Man, here's my students. I'm sitting here buying coffee on the Lord's Day. Man, I mean, the jig is up. I'm done. You know, it's curtains for me. Did I sin? Well, I chose to do it, sure enough. But in ignorance, I'd forgotten it was the Lord's Day. I'm as innocent as Brother Finney. Do you see how it works? You got to know and you got to choose. In that case, I had chosen, but I didn't know. And then I tell about when my wife and I built our home about 16, 18 years ago. We built in the woods. <clears throat> Are you all still with me? It's 8.30. Are you still here? So I made a small backyard. No point in having a big yard. Don't mow any more grass than you have to. And so we're pretty close to the woods. I mean, we had 70, 80 feet trees around the house. My wife's one of those souls who never, she never asks for anything. Some of you ladies know her. She'll go shopping all day and come back with some little $2 item, you know, and she thinks it was a wonderful day. I can't get her to spend money. Eat your heart out, guys. <laughs> but when she does ask for something, boy, I mean, I'm Johnny on the spot. I mean, every, her wish is my command. She said, honey, she said, why don't we buy some bird feeders and do some bird watching? She said, I've seen a lot of strange new birds around here that I don't recognize. 
So, honey, you want to watch birds? We're going to watch birds. We got in a car and drove to Canton, went to some little pet shop that had a bird watching section in it. And we started finding out what kind of birds like, and she loves cardinals. Found out they like sunflower seeds, and we looked at all the different kinds. They were giving us advice. We stood there and watched this little video. If you have squirrels, this is what you need. There's this tube feeder, and then at the bottom is this ring that the birds normally sit on to peck out through the holes to get their seed. But Mr. Squirrel, he'll jump up there and try to help himself. But we watched this little video. This thing has got a little motor into there and a switch, and this little uh, little ring is off center. So the weight of the squirrel tips it, and it makes a contact, and it spins it around, throws the squirrel off. He goes flying through the air. And we stood there and watched that silly thing for five or ten minutes, watching the expressions on those squirrels getting thrown through the air. They didn't know what happened to them. But the crazy thing was $99, and we didn't buy one, but it would have been fun. Anyhow, we bought some feeders, bought the seed, and we started watching them. We bought the books, you know, and another pair of binoculars, and some days she takes pictures. Now, you men that have been married a few, whiles, a few, a few years, a little while, you know, you know how to interpret. Your wife just makes certain sounds, and you know what she means. My wife has a little squeal. Some of them are happy squeals, and some are sad squeals. One morning, I was upstairs, and she let out a happy squeal. And I ran to the top of the stairs. What is it, dear? Oh, she said, look, 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 look. And I went over to the, there was a bathroom window there that was a little lower where I could see out easily. And I ran in there, and she said, look, there's seven of them out there, seven big cardinals. Oh, she was just happy as she could be. Down there, just loving it, taking pictures of these cardinals. One morning, she sent out another sound. This was another squeal. This is not a good squeal, though. She said, look out there, look out there. And I went in the same window and looked out, and there was a big fat squirrel. This acrylic uh, bird feeder, he had hopped up on there and had eaten the hole out a little bit bigger, and the grain just running out like a drinking fountain. He's eating what he wants, and the rest is going on there. I said, I'll take care of him. And I went into my bedroom, and in the closet, I pulled out my 22 rifle. It's got a, it's got a three by nine variable scope on it. That fellow's out there just eating for a fare, and every time he'd turn to the grain, I would slide that window up a little higher and a little higher. And finally, I'm leading out the window. It's not as far as from here, that back door. And finally, he looked up at me and grinned, and I had those crosshairs on him, and I sent him to the great squirrel feeder in the sky. <laughs> he fell dead to the ground, and I went out and picked him up, carried him to the back of the lot, threw him on the burn pile, put the gun away. Man of the house took care of duty, you know. And the next morning, another squirrel. And this became a, a morning affair. This is kind of routine for me. <laughs> Truth be told, I was kind of anticipating it, Brother Hale. Started to look forward to it. Man, I had about 10 or 12 dead squirrels back there. And one morning, after I'd thrown the last dead one on the pile, it occurred to me, I, I wonder if this is legal. <laughs> it is my house. And then we always kick into our rationalization mode. Oh, sure, it's legal. When we were kids on the farm, the deer used to come out of the woods and roll in our grain fields, and the game warden would tell us we could shoot those deer if they were destroying crops. And So I'm thinking, uh, you know, squirrels are really just furry varmints with a big tail, and they'll get in your attic and chew through the wire and burn the house down. And Of course, I'm just taking care of business. Of course it's legal. I had myself all convinced. But every time I'd shoot one, you know, my, my question became a little more loud to me. My conscience was starting to bother me. I decided to call the game warden. The game warden, uh, in fact, the Department of Natural Resources field office, the, the headquarters, is about two miles from my house out on Route 9. I should have known I was in trouble with the Lord when I decided not to make the call from my house. I went to the college and made the call. Some of you will figure out why. And I dialed him up, and I said, now, uh, Mr. Game Warden, whatever he was, I said, uh, I said, tell me about squirrels. I said, it's okay to shoot squirrels on your own property, isn't it? I said, everybody knows that they're pests, you know, and they can do this and do that. And I told him what the game warden used to tell us. And I, I thought I had him to develop correct thinking, you know, and he waited till I was done with my spiel. And then he said, yeah, I said, it's okay. If you don't mind doing 30 days in jail and $500 for each one you shoot. I said, what, what, what did you say? Will you repeat that? No, he said, you heard me. <laughs> he 
He said, it's 30 days and 500 for each squirrel. I said, okay, thank you. <laughs> and I hung up the phone. Now, do you know what has happened here? Let me interpret this for you theologically. I'd been making the choice all along, but I didn't know it was wrong. Any more than Finney, who didn't pay his bill, but he didn't choose to do it. Now, this works the other way. I chose to do it, but I didn't know it was wrong. When I hung up that phone, I had new light. Now I had God's opinion on shooting squirrels. And invariably, somebody will ask me in a vestibule afterwards, did you still shoot squirrels? No. I had to get out of the squirrel shooting business once I got light on it. And that's how it works, friends. <clears throat> you must know it's wrong. You must choose to do it. I've told people to do this, see if this will help. People come by later, they tell me it helps. If you deliberately sin against somebody, you ask them to forgive you. But if you simply made a mistake, you don't pay your bill on Cracker Barrel because you forgot it, you don't have to ask them to forgive you, theologically speaking. Just say, I'm sorry, please accept my apology. So here's what I tell people, apologize for mistakes and get forgiveness for sins. Now that's, that won't be helpful for some of you, but some of you will figure out where I'm going with this. We had a man in our denomination one time who was in charge of the ministerial retirement fund. It's a committee that oversees that. And uh, when you su superannuate in Allegheny, they really take care of their ministers. I'm waiting to get my first check. I just superannuated last June. And I understand with uh, 40 some years of service, I'll get something like $800 a year retirement. Now, when I was a kid, we'd say that's not heavy bread, okay? <laughs> but anyhow, there was probably uh, a million and a half dollars in that fund. A lot of preachers get, get that monthly payment. Well, the man that was in charge of that invests, moves money around. That's his, that's his thing. And one day, this dear brother invested $250,000 with a financial manager who turned out to be a fraud. That man did a number of years in the state penitentiary, I think in the state of Arizona. But our dear friend, he lost the conference a quarter of a million dollars on a bad investment. Wow. And this guy is so tender, and it just, just about destroyed him emotionally. When he found out what had happened, he just, man, he just went under. All year long, people talked a little bit about it, and everybody just tried to put it to, put it to bed. But you know, a quarter of a million dollars is a lot of money. So it was time for him to make his annual report. So finally, we're sitting there in conference, maybe 300 people sitting in the tabernacle, and they call for the finance report from the retirement committee. And this poor brother gets up and goes down to read his report from the microphone. Just got started reading, broke down, sobbing, crying. Everybody's crying for him, feeling so sorry for him, what's happened to him. And somebody made a motion. Somebody jumped up, said, Mr. Chairman, he said, I make a motion that we forgive our brother for what he did. And somebody seconded it. And they're about ready to vote on it. And I'm thinking, forgive him. He hasn't sinned. He made an awful mistake. He hadn't quite done his homework enough on this fellow. He was taken in by a, by a quack. And it cost a lot of money, but really it wasn't a sin. And I'm trying to remember, it's been enough years I can't remember, but I'm thinking somebody maybe got up and said something to that effect. Really, we should just accept his apology. He doesn't need forgiven. He's apologized, and we're going to accept his apology. So you can sin and get forgiveness, or if you make a mistake. If I forget your name, some of you are working on your names. I'm sorry if I've asked you two times already your name, I may ask you again. I tell my students, as a historian, I seem to remember the names of dead people better than I do living, but I'll work on it. But if I forget your name, that's not a sin. It's a mistake. I'll probably apologize for my inability to remember very well. When we got married, I said that I took my wife a thousand miles away. By the way, as the man of the house, I said, honey, I'll take care of the checkbook. All right, she said, that's fine. And I did. Boy, did I ever. I bounced three checks in about a month. I said, honey, why don't you try it? <laughs> Couldn't get any worse, right? <laughs> when you're at that level, it can only get better. 
And you know, for 50 years, she's never bounced a check. In fact, she can argue with a banker over a penny and win. Because I make a mistake mathematically, does that mean I sinned? Now you see, with all this mistakes, the Calvinists call those sins. See, if I forget your name, I sinned. Everything is sin. So from their definition, their definition of sin is not knowing it and choosing to do it. Their definition is just anything that's not perfect is sin. Anything short of absolute perfection is sin. Read your definition for yourself. It's in all their standard theologies. Well, if we'd go by that definition, sure, we all sin every day. We make mistakes all day long. But that's not a definition of sin. To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. It's pretty plain. I'll close with this illustration if you promise not to get up and leave. I was about 1963. I had graduated from high school, and uh, Mom was the cook at the old Salem Bible College. Dad was a maintenance man. So I could go for free, so I took a semester. My heart really wasn't in it. I was already halfway through my x-ray technician program at the hospital. But anyhow, I took some classes. And that winter, that December, uh, the uh, Old Salem Bible College <clears throat> was going to give a Christmas cantata in the Old Salem Church. Now, they have a beautiful church today, like you do. But that church I'm talking about was an old converted machine shop, cement, cement block building, flat ceiling, about nine feet high, plain tile floor, block walls, noisy, old opera seats in there. But it was time for the Christmas cantata from the college, and the place was jam-packed that night. People standing down the sides, crammed in everywhere you could. And it's about 25, 26 minutes after 7, and the service is going to start at 7.30. Some of you know George and Mary Sunstrom. The Sunstrom, Sister Sunstrom was the choir director. And she has her choir lined up ready to march in. The risers are on the platform. It's going to be a big production. Everybody's excited. Well, behind her in the vestibule were the Sopranos. And then there was one Sunday school room above the vestibule. I'd been up there many times in Sunday school class. So going up the set of stairs were the altos and on up the steps were the tenors and the last at the end of the line up there were us basses. We're standing up there with about five minutes, four minutes to spare. And I'm just standing around killing time and I noticed this nice door, typical birch flush door like that one over there, brass door knob on it. It occurred to me I'd never been in the next room. So I decided to reach over and investigate. So I reached over and opened the door and stepped in the other room, only there was no room there. There was nothing there. It was dark. I had the most horrible letdown feeling in my life. And I started down through the ceiling. <clears throat> light started to appear, but light should be overhead. My light started coming from beneath. So here I come piling through the drywall. I hooked one arm over a floor joist and hung there for a while. My pant legs up to my knees and my brother is sitting in the back row. He sees the ceiling open up and a pair of legs drop through. He taps his wife and says, honey, those are Paul's legs. <laughs> About that time, I lost my grip and fell on through. And dear Sister Sunstrom was standing right, this little sweet, quiet, cherub maiden of, handmaiden of the Lord. She deserved better than this. And I ricocheted off her left shoulder and landed on the floor beside her. My brother said she just jumped up and down for a little while and her feet moved, but she didn't go anywhere. Then he said she got traction and ran all the way to the front of the church, and he said she just kind of jumped around and made funny sounds. <laughs> Hoping nobody had noticed, I got up on a chair and tried to push the drywall back up, but it wouldn't stay put. And I just gave up and ran out the church and left. Met my mom and dad outside and said, you won't believe what happened. They didn't. Now... Did I sin? It's a horrible event. Burned forever on my brain. Really, it wasn't a sin, though. It was an awful mistake. So it really doesn't matter how big the fiasco was. The question is, did you know it 
was right or wrong, and did you choose to do it? Get forgiveness for your sins, apologize for your mistakes, walk in the light, and the blood will cover.